Hello, everybody. This is the Chocolate News Podcast. I'm your host, John Alexander Reese. And if you didn't know, the Cincinnati Herald has been around since 1955 and is the leading African American owned newspaper in the greater Cincinnati area and Northern Kentucky area. And today we have with us our digital correspondent, Andrea Carter. How's it going, Andrea? Fine, John. How are you doing? I am doing well. So, Andrea, what's the chocolate news of the week? Well, it, unfortunately, um, the, the, the biggest news is the death of Desmond Tutu. He was the moral compass of South Africa. Um, he was known for being upfront, upfront and frank about various issues regarding South Africa, especially during apartheid. Um, he was the moral compass during the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that sort of forged that bridge between victims of apartheid and the rest of society and how they brought people together to vent, listen, heal, and then move forward with a new form of government with the ANC in charge. So um, he's going to be truly missed, not just in South Africa, but around the world, because he, he, was, or, he was the world's moral compass on a number of issues that affected people around the world, especially those in poverty and those suffering, untold economic suffering that could have been prevented or at least righted. And I think um, everyone has been sending out messages of sorrow over his passing, especially uh, the, the, the Duch and Duch Duchess of Sussex, Harry and Meghan, how they met with him right after Archie was born and you know, and the Archbishop blessed Archie and, you know, blessed their marriage and things like that. They were good friends with him. And so that he's going to be truly missed by everybody. Yeah, it really is sad. I saw a huge response on social media about his death. He was one of the leading, um, you know, uh, political figures in, well, was he a political figure in South Africa? He spoke about the politics. He was not a politician per se. Well, but then again, you know, as a religious person, there's church politics. So okay. in a way, he was political just on a different level, um, if I could put it that way. <laughs> yeah. um, but he, I mean, he met with a number of world leaders. He received a number of accolades and awards. He visited Cincinnati, I think, at least two or three times. I remember um, early in my um, news career, I got to cover him when he visited Cincinnati in the 90s. And it was um, an inspiring experience just to hear him speak and talk about things. And his daughter, one of his daughters traveled with him and she was um, inspirational in her own way, working with her father. I remember that time. And then I know after I left Cincinnati for a while, he also came back again, but I forgot the reason why he came back. So he, he was known in Cincinnati. Um, he was a good friend mm. to the to the, I would say the civil rights movement, but also in the Anglican church, a moral compass for um, leadership and um, being spiritual and doing what is right for the people. Sad to see him go, I should say, but it's gonna be interesting to see who fills his shoes. Definitely. Now, 2021 is coming to a close and it was definitely an interesting year. Um, and, part of that interesting year was definitely about the court cases that occurred over the years. So can you tell us more about that? Um, it, it, I would say 2021 was definitely an interesting year. Um, not just from, well, from a court perspective, a political perspective, a health perspective, depending on which one, but for us, for the black community, we had a huge focus on the justice system this year especially um, calling out those acts of, of excessive force used by police officers in cases where their, their acts of force could have been prevented if they had chosen to use thought instead of force. I would say first off would be the um, trial of Derek Chauvin with George Floyd, where he was convicted in that death and he received 22 and a half years um, in prison for that conviction. And then later he just recently pled to federal charges um, on similar charges. And I think that sentence has not occurred yet, but it, they may end up running concurrently if he can, you know, having pleading to 
the charges and not going through another trial. But I think what was interesting about his trial is the prosecution created a roadmap on how prosecutors can take a look at a case against a police officer. And normally in the past, prosecutors put the whole police department on trial. This time, um, the prosecution just put the police officer on trial, looking at his actions, looking at his record, looking at his training and his interaction with the community. And you um, saw a police department choose to break that blue wall and say, yeah, we don't do that. Yeah, we don't do this. This is our standard. And you saw that blue wall broken again with the recent conviction of Kim Potter. Again, she, even though it was a mistake of her pulling her taser instead of her gun, the prosecution again went after the person and her training and, you know, broke down all the arguments that a defense could come up with. And, you know, it's rare to have one police officer convicted, but to have two convicted for an excessive, excessive force or mistake um, is unbelievable. Um, and I think, you know, the Black community saw solace in that justice, but I think also it's going to send a message or a subtle message to other police departments, get your act in order, because all white juries normally are known not to convict police officers, convicted both these police officers. And that is the biggest game changer, that people recognize wrong is wrong, and you must pay the piper when you do wrong. I think also um, those are the top cases. There are other cases brought against police officers in other um, counties and cities where they were not charged for excessive force. So there's, we, we still have a long way to go, but this was a step in the right direction of treat people decently and you won't have this. That's it for 2021 in terms of that direction. And then um, you had Kyle Rittenhouse who yes. um, attended a protest in, was I believe Wisconsin? Yeah. Kenosha, was Wisconsin. Yes. And he ended up shooting um, several people um, at first thought, and I still assumed, I thought there was a black individual involved, but no, a black individual supposedly threatened him, um, but he did not shoot a black person. And anyone he shot and killed were all white during that protest that they held there, but he was, he um, was not convicted. And, you know, there's still some issue with um, how can a young man who, quote, was going to a protest, quote, protecting an entity and then walking around saying that he's a friendly, friendly, helping people and he's carrying a gun. There's something wrong with that picture. There's something wrong with that look and that viewpoint. Even though Wisconsin is a um, hunting state, people do hunt, people do carry guns. And, um, you know, there's just a long way of what is acceptable and what is not um, acceptable behavior even if you do have an open carry law in your state and you don't think it's wrong for someone to be carrying a rifle down the street, there's something wrong about it when you see a gun owned within the, in a um, person's hand during a protest. That's emotion, that's um, stress, that's reaction in a way you don't want to happen. And in, 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 in this case, Kyle Rittenhouse, that's what occurred. And unfortunately, he was not he was not convicted of shooting that young man who died. Unfortunately, uh, I think two people died, and I think one two people died. Like, yeah. yeah, and one and, was I mean, injured. There are so many cases, you know, where this happened and that happened. Yeah, it, it tends to run together, but not that being an excuse. But I think it's it's unfortunate that I feel for the families who did not see justice in that case. Yeah, um, you know, an innocent bystander. Pro, you know, exercising his right to protest something, that freedom, and it was shot down by someone who was, quote, protecting. By a kid, um, who, wanted by a kid. Play, who wanted to play soldier. Yes, and, and now he's being touted as a conservative symbol of upholding peace and democracy, and 
unfortunately, he's just an 18 year old kid who's getting his 15 minutes of fame. But it will be interesting to see what how his future plays out and what actions he does in the future, which will either prove that the court was right or the court was wrong. Well, I mean, so far from what I've seen, he's been on the right wing talk circuit and all that stuff. He met uh, former President Trump, you know, so I think I see the way this is going. He's probably going to, you know, speak at all these conservative uh, conferences and all that stuff. Uh, right wing hero, probably run for office eventually, you know, that's just, you know, unless something changes, but I, I highly doubt it, though. I doubt it, too. But I mean, it's just it's one of those things of where you just have to just hope that he he sees the wrong of what he did because he has to live with the fact that he killed two individuals at the end of the day he still has to accept that that stain on his karma on his person that he took life and i didn't i didn't see any remorse in that courtroom i didn't see anywhere where he felt sorry that that occurred i just see that kid got off and he's reaping the benefits of being of being found not guilty you know somewhere i like to hear him say how this affected him because that individual at the end of the day he could go on get his 15 minutes of fame those people cannot they're dead they're gone they're buried and something needs to be said about that some sort of restitution should occur for those who died i want to talk a little bit more about the uh Ahmaud Arbery case and how, you know, how justice was served in that case, because, you know, there was doubt whether, you know, the three people who killed Ahmad were going to actual prison, but at the end, justice was served. Um, so I'm glad about that. I am glad about that. I mean, it, if you think about it, um, in the past cases like that, um, individuals, got off you know if we go throw back to the 50s 60s 40s people got off for doing stuff like that yeah um unfortunately we you know we're in a new day and age and i i think the fact that ahmaud aubrey did not react to those individuals until he was confronted and they started quote hurting him you know back you know when he was trying to escape them and their ridiculousness so to save his life and he couldn't escape them and they eventually shot him. I think in their warped sense of nothing else better to do, they thought they saw a black man walking on a property, which they didn't own and they were not asked to protect, but in their mind, they knew he had committed some crime. And because of that thought, um, they pursued him got their neighbor involved in that pursuit, had a good old time laughing and joking afterwards when it was all said and done, and then come to find out they committed a crime. Yeah. They didn't think they did. They thought they were, you know, stand your ground, doing right, protecting the neighborhood from some injustice. And come to find out there was no injustice. Other people had done it as well. Um, they didn't stop them. And um at the end of the day, the police officer who, in a roundabout way, had deputized them, didn't mean to do it. And he said, oh, God, I didn't mean to do that. I was just asking if they had seen anything, you know, but not to go all out and protect. Right. Um, just, you know, do your, he was probably thinking long lines of neighborhood watch. If you see something, say something. Yeah. Do not go after them. But when you're hyped up and you know, former police officer, you think you're justified, you get people involved with you, you know, and the, and the son and the neighbor did not think about what they were doing. And the neighbor recorded the whole issue and the defense authority who, you know, gave, turned over the video, thought that it would exonerate what they did. And that goes to show the bias that was in the case to begin with, that started the case and they thought because everyone had that bias that they would get off. And you sort of knew the case was going a certain way when the one attorney kept jumping up and objecting to when Reverend Jesse Jackson and Reverend Al Sharpton were sitting in, in the audience watching the case. 
And it unnerved him saying that they're going to sway the jury. How are they going to sway the jury? They're just sitting there. They have nothing to do with the case. They're supporting the family. And the more that attorney brought attention to it, the more the jury was like, okay, there's something here. If he kept his mouth shut, they might not have gotten as much as they did. So who's, who knows? It, it, it's, it's, it's an unusual case that um, you hope to never see again. Right. And I wanted to expand a little bit more on the Kim Potter trial, because when we recorded the last podcast, the jury was still deliberating on the outcome of the case. And I think like a day later, they came up with the, uh, you know, the results and everything. So I just want to hear your thoughts on the results of the Kim Potter, you know, trial. Um, she was convicted. Um, I watched when the, the, the judge read, um, read the, um, the ruling. I mean, I read the, the, the jury's comments and the conviction. The fact that the defense attorney requested that she be released on bail and the judge said, mm, no, we're not doing that. We're not going to give her special treatment. She's going to go to jail right away. I commend that judge for treating her like any other criminal convicted of a crime. And she was convicted of manslaughter. I mean, it's a horrible mistake. Yeah. Um, but I think also what pointed what was pointed out by those watching the case is that she got emotionally upset that she killed the young man after her gun went off. But while she was lamenting that, oh my God, I made this mistake, not once did she offer to assist that young man in his last moments of life. Not once did she say, we need to call an ambulance. Not once did she say, let's try to do CPR. Not once did she do any life-saving measure for that young man. Instead, she's crying about, oh my God, what did I do? And the only time she showed remorse is when she cried on the stand. Right. And I think her actions, um, even I don't know if it was mentioned in the courtroom, but her actions immediately after um, she resigned from the police force to save her pension. You know, she took everything, she took every step possible to save herself or save what she needed to survive after she got out of jail. And, um, you know, which I think is smart in one way, but sad in another, because not once did she apologize. Not once did she say, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Or if she did, I didn't hear it. But I think, again, it goes to police officers need to be careful when they make split second decisions. She didn't have to shoot that gun. It was a traffic stop. And even if Dante Wright was resisting, they could have had gotten him out of, you know, they could have handled it in such a way that a life was not lost that day. But I mean, again, yeah. I'm not a police officer. I respect police officers. They have a very hard job. They have to make, react to many different scenarios in, within a moment's notice. And they barely have seconds to decide what their actions and what they're going to do, not only to protect themselves, but to protect the people and the public around them. Traffic stops shouldn't be deadly, either to those who are driving a vehicle and to those who are stopping that vehicle. It should not be deadly because there are instances where people are evil and they do things to police officers. So, and I understand what their training is when they approach a car, how they approach a car when they're looking in, because things can happen to a police officer in that moment because you don't know what that person is thinking. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that person should die if you're stopping them. Uh, it's a two-way street because I've seen good police stops where nothing occurs. I've seen police stops where the, a person gets out of the truck of a car where he'd been stopped by police. Police are respecting his truck for certain things and he ends up pulling a gun on the police officer. And it's and and I've seen that where it is not a black individual, it's a white individual. And sometimes they survive one incident where the victim did not survive at all because he pulled a gun and they shot back and forth and the guy was killed. Because but again, I've seen good scenarios and bad scenarios. Dante Wright didn't have to die. They had enough people on the scene that they didn't have to shoot a gun. Yeah. Um and um it's, it's just a sad situation. I mean, I recommend for anyone to go through um, 
a police academy, if there's a, a, a public academy for people to go through to get to know your police department, you should do it. I think um, those types of training, get to know your police department, give you an insight to what police officers go through. Um, I'm not defending Kim Potter's actions or Derek Chauvin's actions because they went too far. But at the same time, being a police officer is a tough job, whether you're black, white, Asian, Muslim, it's a tough job. Mm -hmm. And I commend people who want to run into chaos instead of run away from chaos. They want to protect you because they have a need to protect people. And I, and I think that, again, justice was served because wrong is wrong. But I think at the same time, we need to counterbalance that for the continued need of police officers, the can, continued need of being safe in society and having someone patrolling and protecting. But at the same time, we need the bias out of the police department because there are too many inc incidents where Black people are dying and others are not. There, there, there's a problem there. And yep. we, we need it called out, not by the Black community, but by the, the greater majority community and call people out. And I think these cases where we had convictions is the beginning of people calling out wrong is wrong. If not, they'll be sued, left the wazoo, and every single department will go broke because they have not learned their lesson. Agreed. Something else I wanted to talk about was, uh, of course, in 2021, we are still dealing with this pandemic, and we're still dealing with COVID-19 and its variants. And throughout 2021, we got the vaccines and everything. They were made available to the public. And we were dealing with the Delta variant for a while. And then it seemed like once the Delta variant was, you know, going down, this holiday season, we were hit with the, uh, the Omicron variant. And now it seems like this is never going to end, or at least that's what it feels like, because I know places are going back. You know, businesses are, some businesses are shutting down again. You know, in some places we got to wear masks again, and people are still not getting vaccinated and all that stuff. And um, I just want your thoughts on that. I think people need to get vaccinated because the science that's coming out with Omicron um, is shown that people who are vaccinated are getting sore throats, that they're having cold-like symptoms and they're not impacted as much as those who are unvaccinated. And the difference is, is that you may have a sore throat, you might have sniffles, you might have a little cough, and that's it. Maybe a slight fever. Compared to those who are unvaccinated, that they're ending up in the hospital needing a breathing treatment. And it is a severe, this virus is affecting our lungs, is affecting our ability to breathe. And the vaccine, the vaccine is your protection of it being a mild case than, than a severe case. And, you know, and I, I believe in doing what is best, what is right. Um, you know, what can I do to protect the family members that I have, especially the older ones? If I want to be around my father, be around my older relatives, be around family, friends, I got to be vaccinated. I have to protect not just myself, but them as well, because everyone can be a carrier of this virus. But if everyone is vaccinated, and even if you pass it along, the impact won't be great, it'll be minor. And I think that's the biggest lesson, is that the impact will be minor, not greater. And eventually we'll get, you know, we'll get to the point where it's a yearly shot, just like the flu shot. Right. And we just have to get there. You know, people, there are a lot of people who think this is an you know, invasion of their civil liberties, invasion of, you know, they don't want to be told what to do and, you know, things like that. And I'm like, well, yes and no. If you think about it, at the end of the day, there are requirements that we all have to adhere to when we take on a job or we go to school or we attend a church or we, you know, go to a restaurant. There's a dress code. Yeah. There is a hygiene code. Yeah. There is rules 
that you must meet to get in. And the fact that people were objecting, they didn't want to be told what to do. In a greater sense, it was a way of controlling the public for the out, a certain outcome that they were hoping for. For, you know, if, if you're into conspiracy theories, let's put it like that. Yeah. Um, but I think at the end of the day, this is beyond conspiracy. This is beyond anything else. This is about health. This exactly. is about doing what is right for the common good. And, and I think the fact that we've had so much resistance is that society is broken when you can't get people to do what is best for the common good. Where is that camaraderie we had when 9-11 hit? Where is that sense of togetherness occurred when, we, when um, President um, Obama announced that we killed Assad bin Laden? Where is that sense of community, of a threat that affected our way of life? At the end of the day, we all benefited from that action. Where is that sense of community? That well, team effort? you know, I'm blaming I'm blaming misinformation. That's I think misinformation is probably one of the biggest problems in society. Well, and unfortunately, it we had a former president who was in charge, who was trusted to do what is right for the con for the community but because he marginalized and only was doing things for those who supported him and what he said he created a whole chaotic disruption and affected people's lives and health and you know joe biden was elected and as soon as he got in the office he took everything in hand and you know we're much better off than we were a year ago Yeah. before definitely. Biden took office. We're yeah. definitely much better. The economy is working. People are able to go back to work in office buildings, um, you know, unless you're still working remotely. People are able to go back to restaurants. Businesses had to pivot for a minute, but they're finding that they are, you know, that pivot made the business even more successful or they found a new way of doing business. Or, you know, recognize that, okay, we have another skill. We can offer this service. And I think that, you know, and some and our habits have changed. Think about this. In the grocery store now, everything is covered. You can't sneeze oh. on the food. Everything yeah. is covered now. If you go to a, a buffet style, you now have to hand sanitize your hands. Yeah. You have to be mask covered. Habits have changed, but you can still eat. You yeah. can still go out. Exactly. Um, like there are hand sanitizer places like everywhere now. Yes. I, I, whenever I walk out of a store, the first thing I do when I get in my car, I hand sanitize yeah. when I'm touching, you know, that, that, that kills whatever I touch kills it on my hands. And then when I get home, I wash my hands. Yeah. Um, you know, again, that kills a lot of germs. So that we're, you know, there's a lot less colds being passed, a lot less flu being passed than ever before. So, some good habits have been developed that should have been developed before some things will go back and passing colds and things like that but at the same time you'll see an impact on keeping yourself healthy what is that new habit so i think this whole thing is a good thing and a bad thing um it's just sad that it has been so politicized um that people cannot see the benefits of technology you know people who choose not to get the shot are dying in record numbers, I believe. Families all over, around the world are being affected in mourning because of loss of life, because of a decision not to get the shot. And which I think is sad. Again, people will believe conspiracy theories. People will believe religious theories. People will believe health theories. Some people believe that, you know, maybe they did not pursue the shot, the vaccination, like they wanted to because they wanted a certain group of people to die out because it was being affected greater than others. Conspiracy theories, you can find a conspiracy theory in anything. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, right is right and wrong is wrong. Yeah. It's this thing with conspiracy theories is that they're being echoed, like I said, by the, our former president. And I, something I found interesting Former President Donald Trump is doing an interview with Candace Owens, uh, a very popular right-wing figure, 
And Trump was basically pushing back the vaccines do work, even though she said they don't work. So I just found that to be, um, you know, a little interesting. Well, I think it's interesting that, you know, Trump, after he got COVID, he got his shots, yeah. he got his booster, and he got booed Yeah, because he got a booster. Yeah. But you know what? At the end of the day, he took care of himself. Yeah. And, you know, even though he's encouraging everyone now to get the vaccine, everyone who's following his initial philosophy are not getting the vaccine and they're dying. Yeah. Which I think is ridiculous because if you want to keep your base, yeah. you need to protect your base. That exactly. means getting the shot. Yeah. Obviously, you don't care about your base because, you know, you weren't pushing the shot. Yeah. Now, the fact that Biden is having a great amount of success, even though people are, you know, blaming him from other stuff, but the fact that the economy is returning, people are finding jobs, people are vaccinated, we're surviving. And even though we have this Omicron possible blizzard coming, at the end of the day, those who are vaccinated will survive that Omicron blizzard, where those who are not won't. I'm only, my biggest concern are, is our young people. How is it affecting our young people? That's my biggest concern because that's our future. That's our world. And if you're not protecting the children and making sure they are safe, how can you make sure that, the, that our future is safe? Our future leaders are safe. You know, that's our wealth. That's our future workers. That's our everything. And I think that, got, that is getting lost in everything. Yeah. Is our future depends upon our children. Even though I think we had a little baby boom with the, with the epidemic and everyone being inside, at the end of the day, you know, that's a precious life. Yeah. Um, you know, and you've got to protect the young. Yeah. And, and when they're old enough to get the shot, get the shot. Just like they have to get everything else. You know, they have to get the shot for polio and for chicken pox and for everything else that we've gotten a shot for over the years. You know, it's just one more added to the blueprint. Yep. Well, let's wrap it up here. And I just want to say, I hope 2022 uh, turns out to be better health-wise. And I'm just hoping people get along. That That's what I'm hoping. Because I'm just tired of everyone being divided. So I'm just hoping that more people at least try to make the effort to understand both sides and try to find some middle ground and just try to be United States of America once again. That's my hope for 2022. I agree because at the end of the day, we all need to get along, quoting Rodney King from way back when. Um, we all need to get along. We all need to function and be together to keep the society going because there's factions that don't want their way. They want to disenfranchise you. They want to destroy your ability to affect change. And at the end of the day, right is right and wrong is wrong. And I, I hope and I pray that 2022 is a better year for everyone. Yes, me too. Um, Let's hope the is. pandemic ends in 2022. That's what I'm hoping. Like, and like at the end of 22, let's hope it comes to a close. That's my, that's my wish for 2022, that it ends in 2022, this whole pandemic. That's what I'm, I, I wish too, because it's going to take a minute for the entire world to be vaccinated so we can all get back to the way things were. But I also believe that we're all have grown and changed in a little bit of way because of this pandemic. And I think we see the world in a new, a new light. And, um, and I pray that 2022 shines bright for everyone going forward. Definitely. Well, Andrea, I want to thank you for coming on the last show of the year. Thank you for sharing your thoughts and thank you for being a, um, thank you for being on this podcast. This was our first year of the Cincinnati Herald podcast. And I want to thank you for contributing to all of the shows. I greatly appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. I think, um, it is a nice way to talk about what is affecting our world. And it's going to be interesting to see what the history books say years from now when they write about this and they teach it, what is going to be the outcome? What is going to be the impact of what we have experienced now? Um, and I think it's going to be interesting to hear what the teachers say. 
and I'm I'm happy to be part of it. And I'm think and I'd like to thank the audience for you know choosing to listen to us and how we talk about various issues. It's not every day we get to express our opinions and talk about world events, but you know, it is, it's, it's fun. And this is fun to do. And I thank you for letting me join you. No problem. And I want to thank all of our staff at the Cincinnati Herald, all of our guests who've came on our podcast before, and we're looking for a bigger and brighter 2022. And remember, if you want to find out more information about today's topics and past podcast episodes, visit www.thecincinnatiherald.com, see the SESH newsletter, or follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Instagram, and LinkedIn. This is John Reese, and I hope everyone has a good day, and I hope you guys have an excellent 2022.